Hi guys, um, I'm showing one minute till our noon hour. So we're going to get this started a little early with our TMN Tuesday. This is our special Thursday edition. Um, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Uh, we are recording today's event and we'll be sharing the recording on our website afterwards and I'll show you where that's at. Um, today's topic is tips, tools, and techniques for hosting hybrid meetings um, as that seems to be uh, the new normal and hopefully a, a piece of the last 18 months that we can take forward um, for many more years to come in order to engage new and diverse audiences um, and in new and diverse ways. So running through just a quick tech check as we get started with today's event. Um, as an attendee on today's WebEx event, don't worry, you cannot unmute or show your video and that is in intentional. Um, on these events, many times we have um, hundreds and thousands of of a join of those that have joined us, and we want to make sure that we give our speaker um, uh, the full capacity to um, to share his expertise and his knowledge with us today. Um, we will be using the chat room, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, as you as we've gotten started here over the last minute, and you see me flipping screens, and you see my mouth moving, but you may not be able to hear us. I want you to take just a quick picture of the screen that you see in front of you um, to check your audio connections. There's a toggle up at the top to, of the screen to make sure that you've selected the right speaker output, turn that volume up. We even had an instance the other day where somebody forgot to plug their speakers in. So make sure your speakers in. Not that you can hear me telling you to plug your speakers in um, if you can't hear anything right now though. Um, so I like to leave this screen up just an extra second for those that are um, still trying to troubleshoot their audio. All right, and then as mentioned earlier, um, we're going to be using our chat tool today. So chat's going to allow for full interaction with our audience and our speaker. Michelle and I are going to be moderating the chat while John is sharing his presentation, and then we'll pause for questions um, and we'll moderate those questions from the chat um, during those uh, Q and A during those Q and A moments. Um, as always, with our uh, chat, please keep that on topic, uh, professional, respectful, um, avoid using acronyms and, and try and uh, use your best spelling and grammar possible, full and clear sentences. The better the question is written in that chat, the better Michelle and I can make sure that we're asking our speaker the question uh, with the intent that you have behind it. Um, and so again, Michelle mentioned earlier, if you are on chat, select to everyone so that you are speaking with, or you're chatting with our entire audience today, and we can help get those questions answered uh, together. Finally, with our WebEx, there's always those hiccups and you never know what's gonna happen. So we have our help call center on speed dial, um, and they have a fantastic FAQ page that helps you to troubleshoot any um, issues that you may still be having. All right, and without further ado, I'm going to get this uh, started for today's event. We are going to be um, introducing John here shortly, and fear not, this recording and the slides will be available afterwards. That was a present. That was a question in the chat, um, and we'll put that on our website, which is um, reachable by going to Naturalist News, selecting the hybrid training offering page, um, and the recording will be posted directly below um, the description here by this afternoon, if not tomorrow morning. And then finally, our webinar etiquette, as always, um, attendees are not able to unmute or show video. Um, that chat function is on for on topic discussion. Please be pro professional and respectful in all comments and questions. Um, this 1 hour uh, event, either live or as a recording can be counted for advanced training hours. Please work with your local chapter VMS admin to get this counted. Um, and again, that web that recording will be posted to the website by the end of today today or uh, first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and we have an FAQ page on our website for more questions. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, as we've gone into the last 18 months, we have switched to fully virtual events and then we switched back to in-person events over the last five, six months or so. And now we're in this kind of limbo of hybrid events um, and really this hybrid events is is the the hot topic right now and the new 
um, uh, the new way for engaging audiences that are able to come to you physically, but also um, audiences that are not able to come to you physically, but are able uh, that want to stay virtually connected um, for whatever means. And hybrid really in my mind, and John will talk about this later, um, allows you to reach twice as many people potentially because you're reaching two sets of audiences. Um, John is the virtual engagement specialist for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Houston College Station. Um, he has years of experience in um, both the virtual side of things and in the in-person educational uh, training layouts. And so he's going to talk about the uh, bridge of those two um, in today's presentation. Um, and John, we're so excited to have you with us here to, for this special Thursday event. Well, I appreciate it. So um, I've got a few slides uh, I can, I'll be glad to kick off uh, in just a moment with. Um, I just, again, wanted to say, hey, thanks to everybody that uh, decided to tune in today. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, this is uh, something new. It's actually a role that I've only been in in probably for about six months now. Uh, but, but just like, like Mary Pearl said, that there was a need and my background in live streaming and in broadcasting and podcasting uh, and in and in education uh, has 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 got me into a position which is really exciting. In fact, one of the reasons why I did this um, was uh, because you guys are actually using a different platform. Uh, I've I've worked on a number of different platforms, and this is an opportunity to kind of get the chance to to play with another one to begin to kind of see what features there are and functionality is, and if there are things that are being done that are different. So this is a great opportunity, and I just appreciate the the, the chance to be here. So thank you. Uh, I did get a little scared. Uh, for a moment there, I thought it was TMI Tuesday, and I thought, I don't know what I need to share on TMI Tuesday. So I was glad that it actually is TMN Tuesday and now on a, on a Thursday. So uh, having said that, uh, let me go ahead and, um, Mary Pearl, can I share my screen? Because I don't, I've got a grayed out button there for me. I think yeah, you. We should be passing those privileges to you. Michelle should be passing that to you now. I am right now. Um, and uh, I just saw in the chat here before I jump into the share here, I saw, I saw where someone said about discussing Zoom as much as WebEx. I'm going to try as best I can to keep this platform agnostic um, I, because in many cases, um, some of what if we go down the rabbit hole of a Zoom or a Microsoft Teams or, or a WebEx um, or anything in between. I've used YouTube Live, Facebook Live, you know, it used to be Periscope is now just Twitter. Uh, all of those kinds of things are opportunities, even Instagram. Um, uh, reels, and I'm not getting into TikTok. Uh, I, I promised my kids I would not do that, so I'm I'm staying true to that. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep this platform agnostic. But but what you want to do is with all of these is is not only think about the platform and what it can offer, what functionality is, because even within those platforms, for example, within Microsoft Teams, um, you've got some options. In Zoom, you've got options. In WebEx, you've got options. So part of it also is understanding what your needs are and what you're wanting to do and what experience you're wanting to create, but also understanding what your end audience is used to and what they're, what you want them to be able to do or not do. Because in some cases, for example, and I'll use both Zoom and Teams, for example, if you are using uh, Zoom or Teams, especially with Teams, I don't even have to, if, if they're on a laptop or a desktop, they don't even have to download Teams. They can just watch it through a browser. Same with WebEx on certain things. But if they're going to use it on a phone, they have to download the application. So some of it has to depend on what you're wanting that person to do on the end uh, with that. So again, try to keep it platform agnostic. Um, but um, I, we can, we can, especially after this, if we want to continue down some of these rabbit holes, I'd be glad to, uh, because in some cases, specific needs are, are specific to functions, capabilities, applications, and what you're trying to do at the end. So uh, I'm just want to kind of keep it there. All righty. So having said that, let's uh, let's jump on in. So, um, like I said, uh, welcome. Hey, that's me. Um, and that was me yesterday. So it's great. Uh, the biggest thing about this slide, besides my head, um, is the fact that my email address is down there. Chiv at tamu.edu. Uh, if you got any questions that you need uh, answered or things like that, feel free to either reach out to Mary Pearl or copy her in on. But if you want to send me something because you've got a you've got a weird bug or you've got something you 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 want to throw my way, feel free. Uh, I'd be glad to hear from you. So, all right. Being what we just saw in uh, in the chat, uh, I want to kind of take a moment and talk a little bit about the idea of a webinar uh, because this kind of sets the the, the framework. 
fortunately or unfortunately, because of where we are, what we've done and where we've been over the past six, eight months to a year, uh, even longer, we've got some terms that people kind of put together and sometimes they mean the same things and sometimes they don't. So we'll talk about a live event. We'll talk about a live stream. We talk about a webinar. Uh, we'll even talk about, oh, I'm just using a Zoom. Um, so let me take a moment. Let me talk about three different, three different possibilities, three different capabilities, because in Web, WebEx, for example, even in Zoom uh, and even in Teams, uh, there's, there's usually three different kinds of ways of doing things. And a lot of it depends on how you want your audience to be able to interact with you and how much control you want over what they're seeing and doing. So um, in Teams, they've got it broken up into a meeting, a webinar, and a live event. In Zoom, they'll do a, just a Zoom meeting, but then they'll do those Zoom events and the Zoom, uh, the Zoom webinars uh, for that. The biggest thing with a meeting and a webinar, those um, are basically what we call video, uh, are just basically video conferences. Uh, in the old, the old days of the old WebEx or the old Cisco um, conference calls, if you're part here at AM, the TTVNs, it was just basically a giant video conference. The great thing about that is that one, it allows everybody that quick video possible interaction, audio interaction that happens right then and there. Um, it's real time, full access, uh, whether it's chat or in some cases audio and video, uh, just like kind of like you have your if you have a Zoom meeting or if you're if you're doing a, a, a church Sunday school class or something like that. That's typically what you're seeing. That is again, that's a video conference. I would call same with webinars. Most webinars are also basically a video conference, but they're what they've done is they just added a few extra parameters or functions to kind of give the the webinar owner, the webinar uh, producer. A little bit more control. Typically, that is the ability to, to, to segment people into attendees and participants uh, for that. Sometimes it has to do with like little bits of registration, uh, but a little bit more control. But again, the focus still is on real time. The last part is going to be what we call a live event, uh, and that could be all, and that and that is also a live stream as well. With those, though, typically what's happening is that the the, the presentation is happening. And then it is, and the producers then are choosing what they want you to see. Hey, I want them to see the full screen. Nope, I want them to see the person. No, I want them to see both. Um, oh, it's a conversation. I'm going to put the two people that are conversing and put it all together. Then that is all packaged, and then it is shipped out and streamed out to wherever the, the host is, a WebEx, a Microsoft, or wherever, even a YouTube. And then 20 to 45 seconds later, because that's usually what it takes to get it shipped, buffered, and then packeted and sent back out then the end user is getting it. While that's kind of live, in some cases it can be a kind of a difficulty because especially if you're wanting people to be able to respond, a lot of times that real-time response chat and stuff is, is now uh, deactivated because it's not happening in real time. And so sometimes if you're doing that, you have to kind of change the way you're doing things, like with questions, for example, so that this Q and, the Q&A, the questions as they're coming in, aren't uh, because they're coming in a, almost a minute later are not segmenting and changing what's going on there. So um, again, so we want to kind of keep that in mind and want you to think about what it's most important to you, production quality, the experience, or that real-time interaction. And, and that needs to be decided really before you get going. So I say that because that kind of sets us up when we talk about what a hybrid is. And for, for many people, for, for well, for most, or for what it should be, a hybrid really is this idea of, I am having both an in-person event, an in-person experience, and something that's happening online, um, elsewhere, virtual. So, um, to the, the biggest example of this, and all of you, I'll bet, have participated in it. Every one of you have probably been a part of probably the largest annual hybrid event, and that is the Super Bowl, if you think about it. Because you have the in-person audience, they're there and they're watching the game and they're there and they're having their $27 drinks and their $57 nachos and they're there. But the other side of it is the virtual audience. That's all of us watching on TV or watching online and many of us participating in a different way to engage. Hey, we're using social media. Hey, we're on Twitter. Hey, we're providing our comments. We're looking at statistics, those kinds of things. So for really for us, that really represents ultimately what a true hybrid event is. It's not the exact same experience for both. I'm not paying $57 for my drink uh, for that. 
but we are getting the same level of and the same quality of the of the event itself. Um, yeah, right, in Mecca Pearl, right, and and we're getting Super Bowl commercials, uh, and that's true. Other things for us to talk about. So I say that because again, we need to start thinking about what then our idea of a hybrid event is. It's it's something again, and you see on this in this little quadrant thing here is that we need to be started in, in some cases. Uh, and let me back up real quick and say this. A hybrid in some cases is actually going a true hybrid in many cases is won't be double the work because you have two separate audiences, but it's going to be more work than just having it just in person or just online. And we have to think of it that way because you have to start thinking about what elements of this event are going to be live live only live streamed is going to be something that we're going to put up after or even put up before. I've seen some great webinars that almost mimic flipped classes or flipped courses where you're getting folks to watch videos and get prepared so then they can become they can come into the to the, the experience ready to go. And again, this goes back to how then are we going to make this uh, interactive interactive on both sides? How are people at the event going to be able to interact with people who are there? How are people virtual going to be able to interact with our speakers or our presenters? And then how or even are we going to let the two audiences be able to interact with each other? Because in many cases, that's just as important. So again, we have all these kinds of things that you need to kind of be considering and thinking about uh, as you go forward with doing this so that you're not causing issues for yourself later as you get farther down into, into preparation uh, and even in production of it. So, like I said, uh, it's like the Super Bowl. Uh, but what it is not is just a camera in the back of the room. All right. A lot of people think, oh, that's my hybrid event. No, because you're not creating an experience that is the same level of quality or the same level of engagement as you would the uh, the the people that are there. In some cases, you're almost creating some division and creating some issues where your audience that is virtual feels like they're second class because you've just got some camera stuck back there and they're only getting this wide view because it's part of a webcam. Okay. The other part is that uh, hybrid events are not one way. It's not we're just watching something. It part of it is the participation. If you think about when you go to a when you go to a, a an in person event, it's as much what happens all around it as it is when you're sitting there in front of the presentation. Because even with that, you can lean over to the person next to you and make a comment about whatever the person said. Or when you're finished, you can grab a bunch of people and have further conversations. So how do we create something like that? That's not one way. Uh, it's also not just a backup recording. Now, we do talk a little bit later about the importance of recording things like this, because there's an opportunity to be able to use that to further market what you do uh, to expand your reach uh, for that. But again, it's not just a one to one replacement on that. But what the great thing about this is, like it says, it, I put down it democratizes the event experience. And what that means is basically for those folks who have low budgets and budget where they're not able to travel or they're not able to get to this. It now allows them to feel that they're on a level playing field and getting this learning and education experience as those that do have those larger budgets or don't have to travel as far or whatever that is. Like I said, it expands your reach. Um, it also expands the content shelf life because a lot of times you can use this as other educational components for pieces, especially if you want to go back in and pull apart some of it to be able to use for other things. Um, and then last, um, it does, it also reduces risk, especially in pandemic, uh, when we're beginning to see numbers and things like that change. Um, the last thing you want to do is to, uh, is to do things that, that, that cause issues for other folks. So, all right. So having really said that and kind of get that started, let's talk really about uh, audience engagement uh, and what that means. We're gonna talk a little bit about what that, how do we get into that and, and the way that we produce our events. Um, and then also talk a little bit specifically about reaching uh, uh, folks that are that are attending virtually as well. So um, the first is really about uh, the idea of hosting. Uh, and I chose this photo because um, in many cases, when I'm doing a, an event all on my own, um, I am the cameraman, I am a host, I am possibly a presenter, uh, and I'm also in some cases expected to do something with that. And the problem with that is it is really hard for most people to do that well uh, on that. Um, it, what I recommend for folks is, is to be one or the other. Is for you, it is to, and this is great. It's like I said, with Mary, you got Mary Pearl and Michelle working together on things, and here I am. So I'm, I'm getting to be the host or the main presenter. I'm, I'm getting to be the presenter, but Mary Pearl's still the host. 
she's able to kind of help us set things up, uh, what's going on. And Michelle's there that she's got there and she's handling that, whether it's chat or, or some of the support things. Because here's what happens is that typically someone that sets this up, and I've seen this in lots of webinars, the person that sets it up is actually, in many cases, the main expert. But because they're spending so much time worrying about connections and audio and things like that, that they don't have the chance to actually be there and be the expert. And many times that's really the people or the person that those attendings are wanting to hear from. So if you've got that opportunity, find a way, if you can, to be able to split those some of those duties up. That's really, really key. Uh, on that. Like I said, for us, um, I try to, to, to do it in a way where you've got, obviously, your presenters are presenting. The producer really is focused on the, the visual experience. This is, I'm, again, I'm the one showing the PowerPoint. I'm the one that's going to show the camera person talking uh, because, again, we're also thinking about uh, people's extent, attention spans uh, on that. But then you've got someone that's also going, hey, I'm only going to be focused on the chat. Because I'll be honest with you, right now, as I'm speaking this, my main focus is slides and engaging with you on this. I'm not really even looking at the, my, the chat because it happens to pop up on a screen over here. So this is where someone like a Michelle or a Mary Pearl in a host or producing role will be able to jump in and be able to say, hey, John, what, can you talk to us a little bit about this or that so that I'm not diverting my attention and getting lost in what I'm trying to say or not say uh, on that. Uh, really great host when I talk about hosting on this, and this is what's expected. For those of you who listen to a radio show and that with radio hosts like talk shows or you listen to podcasts, the most successful podcasts and radio shows are ones in which the host is the one that makes the attendee, the listener, the, the viewer, whoever, feel like that they are part of the production itself. Uh, my wife is a big fan of a podcast called Crime Junkie, True Crime. Um, and um, what she loves about that is that the host there, and it's not just her, I, I, I teach a podcast class and I make them listen to a couple of episodes and almost every one of them will say, I feel like the host, Ashley, I, I, she makes me feel like I'm sitting at a kitchen uh, table with her as she's going through all of this. And again, it's their job to, as a host, to make those attendees feel like they're a part of the event. Not just attending the event, but feel like they're a part of it. And so their job really is like they would be as a host of a party or something like that. It is their job to set the rules. It is their job to be able to make some connections for folks that may be chatting uh, with maybe folks who are in attendance. Because again, a lot of this is also about networking. Uh, it's also their job to do some troubleshooting. In fact, I was recently on a webinar where the main presenter, his, uh, he, had, he decided he had to be outside to do it at Wi-Fi. And sure enough, his laptop crashed, uh, no connection. And without missing a beat, this person with the host jumped in there, talked a little bit about what that person might be doing research. They did not really know the depths of the research, talked about the person, talked about their connection, how they were a great part of the project, and basically was doing a little bit of tap dancing until that person could make that connection and can continue on. But for the end user, for the viewer, it just felt like, you know what? These things happen, but it didn't really feel like it was it was breaking my concentration or the flow of the event. And so that's what it, it's their job to be able to do that and make sure that happens. And it does take some work. And that's why, again, I really recommend that you try and break those roles up if possible. Uh, when we talk about producing the event, um, again, multiple people here, but again, people are really wanting this idea of a quality um, yeah, uh, I just saw something pop up and it says with tech crashes, expect them. Yeah, uh, you know, it's one of those ones where I really do think that in the back of your head, you should always have in mind, what will I say? What will I do? How will we continue on if portions of this break up or, 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 or just die? Uh, we, did, uh, we did one with NASA a while back and everything worked in the run through. It was beautiful. The next day, NASA changed some security settings and we had people who couldn't log in and all of a sudden we were missing presentations. So we scrambled. It's kind of fun when you have a bunch of rocket scientists trying to come up with answers, but we scrambled. And at the end of the day, we even had one presenter where he was presenting on his laptop to himself over the phone and we were running his uh, screen uh, online uh, from another computer from where we were. And so he actually never saw the slides that were coming up live because he was looking at his on his laptop. But again, tech crash, we had a plan in case something, something goes wrong. 
Um, and again, in some cases, you you have to punt things. And again, that's where your host uh, comes in uh, and being able to keep things kind of moving along uh, with that. So again, going back to this again, having good quality audio, good quality video, uh, but think a little bit about the where and how the audio is coming in, especially with a hybrid event, because it's not only going to be the presenter and the, their audio, but it's also going to be the a possible audio of your crowd, uh, or it could be those that are attending online. And again, a lot of it depends on the, the amount of people in your audience and what you're going to look at uh, when it comes to your interaction. But if you are going to be using audio for both people that are in person and those who are going to be online, then you want to make sure that that the audio that's being captured is coming from maybe a secondary camera uh, or a, a guest account or something like that. In many cases with us, what we do is that we have a number of guest accounts set up, AgriLife Guest 1, Guest 2, Guest 3, Guest 4, that we will use on laptops that we can position in different places to be able to pick up either extra video or extra audio. And what we end up doing is that we have those people just basically, we cut to their camera and cut to their audio to be able to use, hey, uh, and this is like great if you've got like um, audience members that are gonna come up and ask a question at the end, we will station a laptop with a video and audio there so that when the person comes up to ask the question, we've got them front and center. So it's not the presenter's role every time to say, oh, so-and-so from so-and-so, just ask this question and have to continue to repeat things. Uh, on that. Uh, part of it for us also is figuring out what we want to do when, when it comes to actually producing this. Uh, the, the, the big three right now are what we call live, semi-live, and recorded, uh, or on demand. Obviously, everybody knows live. We've got live events, and, and, and we're now working with this from the, from the hybrid standpoint. Um, what we're also beginning to see is a greater growth in what's called semi-live. And what that is, is that, that is sections of uh, or portions of an event in person whatever that is actually being shown as if it was live for those of you that grew up in the in the sitcom era at the beginning of an episode like seinfeld for example they'd say seinfeld is shown in front was you know taped in front of a live studio audience in some cases that's what you're seeing is that they are now putting up a produced video that our folks are being able to watch but what they're doing is as the video is being watched by everyone those folks who are the experts of the presenters, they may actually be there to start answering questions and start taking feedback and working through that as the, the simu live event is happening. Uh, even now on TV, for example, with TV shows, you'll actually see the actors or uh, producers or directors of those events or those shows actually getting on uh, to Twitter or, or something like that when the the show is actually being broadcast the first time and they're providing some 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 inside scoop and you're beginning to see lots more and more of that because again it adds greater uh reach and it also helps your producer or your your presenter not to be so worried about chat and question and answer because they're able to start doing that as it's going uh, as it's being played and last the, the the idea of recorded just want to give you guys let you guys know about this is that on-demand webinars um, are growing uh, more so in some cases more than even live. Uh, we just I just looked at a, a state of the industry report. Uh, it was a company that did a survey of over 100,000 webinars. And what they found was that uh, as of 2020, 43% of folks um, are actually watching a webinar now on demand instead of attending it live. 53% are actually attending it live with that, with that, let's see, that's 96, 4% doing both. And I say that because in some cases, it may be something for you to think about where are you going to get the most value? Where is the best way to expend your most, the most amount of your energy? Because again, same thing, whether it's, whether it's recorded or watched on demand or whether it's live, it still is going to require that same level of commitment to the quality of the event itself, whether the people are there or not. So. Last, when you're producing your event, uh, it's great to make sure that you've got both public and private chats running uh, on that. Um, with everything going on here, because we're taking advantage of the chat a lot right now uh, for this, and you guys are providing some great comments and commentary, sometimes we need to be able to talk about some private things like, hey, so-and-so is about up to bat. So-and-so is about ready to, um, is about to join. Or so-and-so, don't forget to unmute your, camp your mic 
some of that you might want to look at setting up maybe a Slack or a WhatsApp or even using a Microsoft Teams or something like that to just use the chat for those that are part of the production so that, again, you can keep that um, where it needs to be and keep your public chat staying on purpose and on, on task and on target for what the event is. Uh, because in some cases, I find a lot of great content in the chat just as much and not littered with production issues as well. I do say also, if you've got the ability, and I mentioned it before, you know, these cameras, like the one I'm using right now, I was playing with this earlier. I have a second camera, which is on my laptop. And so what's great is that I, if I want to, I could, I could cut from camera one to camera two and back. But I can also then maybe use that other camera to set up something else. So if you're doing a demonstration, you've got something on a desk, you've got your laptop camera that you can use on you, but use your second camera, plug that into your USB slot and put that down on the desk where you've got your, your items or whatever else. Um, it may be also something where you just want to set it up so that you've got a, the camera too on a tripod pointed the other direction so you can be able to use that to interact with your crowd so that your online attendees can see your crowd and hear from them. It's also something where you might want to think about using your guest account or using another account with your cell phones. And we did one recently where we actually had um, our we actually had our specialists and our experts inside because it was 108 degrees outside. Um, and yet we had uh, one of our other folks out there with their cell phone uh, or an iPad that was, um, you know, uh, phone enabled. Um, to be able to be that outside camera so that, that the specialist would say, hey, so-and-so, hey, let's go ahead and take a look at that camera here. Can you go ahead and point me at the sheep, this one, or point me here at this goat? And let me talk about this. Okay, now can you slide a little bit? And so what it was great because it now gave even greater interaction because now we almost had that person on that roving remote uh, camera. Again, just using a simple cell phone um, with that. But think about that because, again, even little simple things like that can add greater um, value uh, to the, the presentation itself, but also to the production. So you want to keep, keep that in mind. Again, like I said, because a quality production, again, and I'm not talking about where you have to have George Lucas level, you know, um, you know uh, effects and this and graphics and everything else. But a good quality, good quality audio, people can hear you, good quality video. Uh, where people can see you or be seen uh, with that. And then we create a quality experience and that's going to give us that successful event. All right. Um, so part of that has to do with engagement. And when we talk about engagement, that really is getting our folks who are on the online side of things, how do we get them to participate? And part of this is, is you have to decide ahead of time, how much do you want from them? Because sometimes it may be that you are you are uh, tight on time, or again because you've chosen to do something that is slightly delayed, um, that we have to go the question and answer route instead of doing it a different way. I can't really use chat, or it might be where you know what this is a really divisive topic. I think I just really want to be able to get this out and and do it and and just do that. That's fine. Most people, for the most part, it, it's not that big of a deal for them. What they're wanting is to know what that is going to do. So don't, if you're not going to do a chat, don't offer it. If you're not going to do a question and answer, don't offer it. Also remind them, hey, today we've got to get through this kind of stuff today, uh, and we're going to be walking through this. But if you also tell them, hey, we've got this chat up here today, um, we want you to jump in with your comments and your thoughts and whatever else, then then great but make sure that then you respond to that because what you don't want to do is to say hey we want to hear all your comments in the chat and then you never pay attention to the chat uh on that if any of you have kids you know what that's like when you tell your child i'm just making this up right now when you tell your child when you when your kid says hey watch me because you said hey what are you doing and you say and the kid says hey watch me and you don't there's going to be more and more and more, or they're going to take off and do something else. So again, be upfront with what you want to engage and how much engagement you want. And again, continue to remind them as you go throughout your presentation that this is what's going on. So, uh, and also think about the platforms that you want to use uh, with this. And that can be within the, within the application itself. That can be using um, third party uh, systems like um, Slido or Mentimeter to be able to do real time polling 
to do uh, interactivity uh, for that, uh, even social media uh, on that. But again, think about how those types of, of, of technology can best supplement and enhance what you're trying to do. Um, do you ever, it's funny you just mentioned that. I'm going to jump to the next slide here. Um, you talk about Twitter. Um, a lot of us, again, think about what your purpose is um, on this. Um, so we have some folks that actually have used Twitter. I actually have used Twitter before as well. Um, and the reason for that was, one, we wanted to bolster a lot of the traffic on Twitter. We wanted also people to, to start knowing where our Twitter was so they would follow us so we could build a Twitter base. But also in some cases, we were using some of those with a hashtag and then hyping up that hashtag to start trying to get some of these cross conversations happening, be able to start building on that. So in some cases, I'm, I'm almost getting a double, a double dip in using something like Twitter. The downside to this though, is that, yeah, while we're using Twitter and using Twitter in that way, if people are, it, it, again, you're opening yourself up to the rest of the world uh, for Twitter, because again, they can be searched for and everything else. But at the same time, um, you also don't want to create something where people are seeing information, but not being able to jump in and be able to join something. So a lot of it just depends on how you want to, how you want to use it. But in some cases, it's a good thing, especially if you've got a large attendee base um, as a means to get them interacting with you on social media, because social media may be where you want to do things later. Other possibility is that you're beginning to really see a growth in Facebook Live, Instagram uh, with their Reels and with Twitter uh, on that. In some cases, using Twitter is not a bad thing, especially if you are live streaming this out to Facebook. Uh, so you might as well have them commenting on Facebook. But I know I think Mary Pearl was mentioning, you know, if we live stream, if we're doing this now and live stream this out to Facebook, she was she was telling me and Mary Pearl, you you can you can stop me if I'm lying. She was like, I can't handle the chat and monitoring and and doing this effectively in both at the same time. Because I'll be honest with you, I can't see any chat from Facebook right now. If anybody was making comments in live as it's happening, I can't do that. What we've normally done with our Facebook live to give you uh, a quick breather, John, is when we stream when we live stream and we're not live streaming this event today, but it, when we do normally live stream, we will. Um, have a uh, a comment that we will post at the very top that says, please note we are not currently checking the questions uh, or the comments on Facebook Live. We'll attend to these questions and these comments um, once the live event is over. And that way, the upside to using something right. like um, the upside to using something like a Facebook Live is really to focus then on that platform specifically so that you can then because the nice thing about that is that you've got that going and then I have the ability to do the comments underneath. It's the same thing with YouTube Live. Um, one of the things I like about YouTube Live, if you're watching it on YouTube, is that I've got the screen there, and then right down the right-hand side, I've got the chat, and I've got everything in there, and I can I can add people in to moderate. We've got folks that can help on things, uh, and it's a great thing for it. The other nice thing about it um, is that I can even I can even embed both the chat and the video window into a web page, and then I, I'm, I've got that all together. But it becomes difficult when you've got the video and and the engagement that the presenter is trying to do, and then the, the public's uh, interaction coming from somewhere totally different that they're not able to easily get to. Uh, and that's especially, uh, especially important when you're trying to say, yeah, I, I want this to get out to everybody. Well, if that's the case, then how do you want to handle your feedback? Are you going to get feedback from everywhere? Or is this something where I really just want to focus my feedback on one, and therefore I'm only going to choose one platform so I can be all in there? Um, I would say also, again, so with uh, WebEx, depending on the level or, or the type of WebEx event or meeting or whatever you're doing, um, they do offer some great tools. Uh, Microsoft Teams, for example, does it. Zoom does it as well, where you can add your own forms in and add your own polls. Polls I love because what the nice thing about these is that it allows people to anonymously to be able to respond. Um, and it gives everybody this, this feeling of instant gratification. I, I answered my question and I quickly saw where, whether I'm in a majority, I'm a minority, I'm in, uh, wow, I'm the only one that picked this. Um, and that's a great thing because again, that starts helping people feel like they're all a part of something. 
it's not just a presenter and a, and a single person at the other end. It now makes them feel like they're a part of something larger, something greater, and something more important. And so I really do recommend that you, you, that you look at something like this. Uh, like I said, Slido is a great is a great product. It actually has integrations with things like WebEx and with uh, Microsoft Teams. It's something that we can um, uh, we can use. Um, I just saw Deborah, you just mentioned something about um, about forms and stuff in um, uh, hybrid. Actually, these actually, if done right, can work really well um, for that. But like, so for example, with Slido. Um, Slido works really well because it can be something that can be embedded into your hybrid uh, into your online experience or uh, it actually can be done and embedded into a PowerPoint slide uh, into, into Google Slides. And then that allows your audience, whether they're there or in person, to be able to just use their phone. Um, some of them actually, uh, like for example with Slido, they actually have a QR code at the top left that allows people with their phone just to QR code snap. It opens up the form with the, with the poll or the quiz or whatever. And what I like about it is that these companies are actually thinking beyond just a, a multiple choice question in your poll. They've got word clouds, they've got all kinds of spider webs and things like that that really do get people thinking and getting information to show up in a different way. Uh, just because I could, I actually used the uh, word cloud one from Slido the other day in my uh, class that I teach uh, in uh, ag journalism. Uh, and it was great to have 90 students uh, to be able to put in their four letter major and this really cool word cloud pop up and you could really see, wow, we really do have a lot of you know, AGCJ majors. Oh, look, wait a minute. I got a, I, and I was like, why do I have an architecture major in here? Uh, but it was great because it was all of us together. We could begin to talk about this. So yeah, there are some great tools out there that you can use for both your in-person audience as well as your, your, uh, your online audience. And together, they're able to work together and be able to be a part of something together. And that's just so key uh, on that. Um, so yeah, make sure you, you you look into this. It's a great uh, these are great opportunity and tools to play with. Um, again, but you, you guys have brought up a good point. It also also depends on how you are broadcasting some of these out as to what's going to be the best for you and when you respond. Because in some cases, if you are using something like a live event where it is slightly delayed, then what you want to do is to do it and then maybe come back to it a couple of minutes later, knowing because you've got that little bit of a delay. Uh, but that also that delay has also been covered by the folks that are watching online. So it's just again, it, it's it's involving the audience, acknowledging them, and making them feel like yeah they're a part of this, and that's what they're looking for. Uh, so again, it's like I'm saying, you know, online attendees want this quality experience. They want to feel like hey, especially if they paid some money, they want to feel like hey, I got my money's worth on this. But what's really key about the hybrid thing is that they want this idea of an equivalent experience. It's not that I just want a great experience. I want the same level and same quality of experience that I would get if, is, is if I was there. It doesn't have to be the same, but it needs to be equivalent. So uh, that's what we want to make sure. So that's what I'm talking about here is that what, first of all, how are you, and when you think about putting this together, is that how do the in-person elements that you have as part of your event, how do they translate virtually or do they translate? In some cases, they don't translate. And if that's the case, where do you balance that out? So, for example, I mentioned networking in there. How do you how do you do that? Well, in some cases, it's the chat. In some cases, it's getting the chat with questions preloaded, polls preloaded, so that you can begin to get people. And in some cases, it's a great to have a host that knows a little bit of the landscape, an opportunity to be able to make connections for people. You think about a host of a party. You walk into the party and you come in. They're like, hey, John, come in here. John, you know, you do virtual engagement. Hey, this is Bob over here, and Bob is about to do a virtual conference. Have you met Bob? How do you, how do you create that? What are those opportunities there to be able to do that? And there are a lot of creative ways to do that. Some of it is just as simple as being able, like I said, shout outs at the beginning. Who all's on? But then again, now that also from that, asking questions or begin to put people together uh, for that. Shannon, you said don't discount YouTube for educational purposes. Oh, no, absolutely not. To be honest with you, I got my start in this by using YouTube um, and, and using YouTube as a mixture of both live streaming with, um, with YouTube Live, um, but also being able to use certain, be able to use videos, be able to put videos out to create this larger experience where I want people to be able to get these other pieces of video. And that's where, again, we talk about having a hybrid experience that's equal. Yeah, the people that are in person are going to have this ability to do something. But if you are able to give your hybrid audience 
hey, here's the here's what you're going to be watching today. But underneath it, here are some other videos that might come in handy as we talk about these things today. Hey, here are some extra PDFs that we have that will help you as we talk about this, that, or the other. So yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I think any bit of technology that's out there that helps enhance that person's experience online, especially when we're trying to make sure that it equates to something as, as important as, as people being here, I absolutely uh, for that. Also think about things like, again, question and answer, question and response. How am I going to how am I going to handle that? How am I going to to make sure that questions being asked in person are understood and answered in the same way that people are going to be doing online and vice versa? We've got even people that actually talk about how do we do swag? Because you know, when you go to a conference, it's like, hey, look at all this stuff I've got. And we've had folks where they've planned and they've mailed out and sent out swag. Like, hey, you know, it's all branded out where it's like, hey, you know, you know, for the conference. And basically, you know, in it, uh, and I, I got one recently for a, for an online uh, a, a hybrid event, and inside was a lanyard uh, and a name tag, even though I wasn't going anywhere, but, you know, I still put it on, uh, you know, pencil pen, a little pad, uh, some materials right there, and a, a QR code coupon. And this is what I thought was the coolest thing. Now, granted, you got to have money for this, but they, they did a little bit, and they said, hey, we're now going to take a, uh, we're not taking, a, we're having our, um, our uh, coffee break. Your code in there, the code itself was uh, actually a $10 code to uh, Uber Eats. And they're like, everybody go get something or have something delivered. Um, and the, everybody stayed online. People got their drinks and the cameras were on for the people that were there. And then people were coming in and the guys that were the hosts were like asking questions like, hey, what did everybody get? What did you guys opt for? You know, this is what we've got here. And so part of that discussion was people talking about, hey, I managed to get this or that or whatever. So it was just a great, but again, it takes some creativity and it takes some planning uh, as well. So again, that's what we want to do. Because ultimately at the end of the day, it's that last question. How do we make people feel valued? And that's really what we want. Uh, how do we people with people that, that we care about them and we care about them in the way that we're delivering the information to them um, as well. So, uh, and I say that, and I'm not going to be the best, uh, uh, and, and I'm kind of, kind of, this is more of a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. Um, we have to understand that um, online presentations are a whole lot different than in person. You know, even, even when I'm sitting in person, again, I can start a conversation with the person next to me. Um, I can look around the room, and I can do other things, but when we're online with people, we're kind of forcing people to kind of be looking at the camera or looking at the screen uh, for that. And sometimes... Uh, and I'll mention this in a few minutes, and sometimes it's not the full screen. You're actually forcing them to look at a picture of a picture within a picture uh, because of a browser window and then the application window or, or the application window and then the screen and then the, the, the smaller screen inside. And so really and truly, we, I really do recommend folks to say, uh, take your presentations. If you've got a 60-minute presentation, you really need to cut that down to 45 uh, or really and truly cut it down to 30 and 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 give you know about 15 minutes for q and I mean really truly this presentation six hours uh, and uh, I've, I've managed to cut it down to this no I'm, I'm just joking uh, on that but yeah no it's it's something on that and it's and it's hard um, yeah exactly Matthew again uh, dealing with all of that so think about that think about how you break things up and in some cases going back to what we talked about before and we am talking about using YouTube in some cases, how are there opportunities where you can get the presenter to really cut their th cut their material down to 30 minutes, but maybe provide you another video or another recording of something extra that can be something that can be watched on demand a little bit later. So opportunities there to think about that and think about your years and, and, and the fatigue that happens um, with this um, from, from staring at the screen all the time. All right. Um, let me, uh, I've got a few final slides are kind of a, um, Kind of a, some quick hits, uh, so I kind of want to kind of walk through those. A lot of it before the before was more kind of the philosophy and the and the thought process going on here. But here, really and truly, with your experience, a lot of these things are going to be just the basics. If you can hit a lot of this, you're covering a lot of what needs to happen. The first is make sure that everybody that needs to be seen is seen. Okay, cameras on. A lot of times, I like having even in a large event, I like having everybody's cameras on, just so we can see and people can feel like, wow, I'm in a big group. I mean, have you ever gone to an event where it's like, you know, several hundred people, you sit down in your seat, and the first thing you do is you turn around in your chair and you start looking to see who all's here and who all's there and, and what are they wearing, what's going on? We like that sometimes. And so sometimes we do that. 
And uh, what I do recommend also is that if you've got the chance is to be able to use uh, a multiple can. Uh, I'm going to jump to I'll answer your question about bandwidth in just a second here. Um, multiple cameras uh, will help um, with that. Again, like I said, even if you've got just putting the camera on at front on, on the front side and the back side is enough. Or if you've got some of these smarter cameras, ones that will pan and pivot and pivot and tilt, depending on who's talking. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of, if anything, it helps break up our our focus on one specific part of the screen. You know, really, truly, it, this is really weird. Uh, in 2000, Microsoft did a, um, a survey of basically uh, online attention span, and they did a survey. In 2000, it was, I think, 16 seconds. So I'm not going to sit here for 16 seconds and just stare at the screen, but it's 16 seconds, and that seems quite a lot. Uh, in 2015, so 15 years later, they did the study again. They found that the survey came back and the results said it was now, what, I think they said eight seconds or six seconds. So in, in many cases, opportunities were cameras and things that change people's focal points, even whether it's a slide um, or things like that, uh, it helps. Because again, it's just kind of helping keep things keep moving, helps keep it kind of continuing to having to focus or refocus uh, and kind of do their, um, their uh, attention span. Um, so... Um, again, <laughs> I just saw the one on there that talks about, you know, empty chairs or things like that. That's true. Um, that, that's true. You need to also be careful and make sure that you're also, again, maximizing the experience by what you're showing or not showing um, with that. Um, we have a lot of folks that will do that. And then as soon as the presentation starts, they will force everybody's cameras off um, and, and do it that way um, just to, to do that. I like having cameras on at the beginning to be able to see folks. Uh, I am just a personal person. I like seeing who people are. I like names and faces and things like that. But when the production starts and we really get going, I will do that. I will I will cut everybody off that I can uh, if we're going that route, especially if you're doing like a webinar or a meeting style, so that I can make sure that everybody's attention is going to be on the main speaker uh, or on their presentation. So a lot of times I'll be even using smaller things like uh, spotlight tools or uh, or the ability to, 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 to turn people into attendees and not presenters uh, to make sure that that happens uh, as well. I will say this, the other thing, the quickest uh, thing that gets people in and out uh, of a presentation is going to be audio. Um, we want to make sure that that audio is clear and clean for everybody. And I say that also so that as you're conducting a hybrid to make sure that both parties, online and in person, can, can hear. So... A lot of times we'll we'll see this. You've got some folks inside. They ask a question or something happens, and the guy starts talking. Yeah, yeah, so and so. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. Well, the guys that are online have no idea what's going on. This whole side conversations happened, and what happened? So I would recommend you either minimize your side conversations, or make sure again both sides are hearing things. So even the people that are online, if there's a chat that's going on that's really good, there's an opportunity to put that chat up on the screen or help them see what's going on um, for that. And again, a lot of folks have a lot of great uh, equipment, a lot of great opportunities uh, with that. Um, and um, some of those microphones can help. Uh, you, a lot of it also just depends. You know, we talk about sound boards and we talk about conference mics and things like that. Some of those can. A lot of it just depends on the quality of the device itself. Uh, we've had some that are out there, and because they're omnidirectional, they pick up everything. And now all of a sudden now when someone like, – so, for example, I was in one the other day, and they had one of those conference room mics, and it was for everybody. And that was great when the presenter was up there because I was I was a little ways away. And so I wanted that audio up close, but I could use my camera because I have a, 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 a separate camera that I was able to zoom in on them and get that. The problem was they were also serving lunch, and so whenever somebody would talk or somebody would cut their food – all of a sudden, the camera, especially that little PTZ the camera that would pivot, uh, would tilt back over the person, and they're cutting their food. Fortunately, I wasn't using that, but the audio kept getting picked up because of that stuff that was there. Again, we want to make sure that the audio is clean as possible um, with that. Um, I say don't share the screen unless you need to. Um, I do that um, just mainly, and again, this, and this may not be a legit rule for y'all today, but it really is up to the producer uh, what they're wanting people to see. Um, and uh, I personally love the idea of eye contact and the, the chance to see someone talking. But I'm also one that when I'm saying, hey, look at this list, I really want that screen up so you can really see that list. So, um, again, that, that's where we really want to be able to do this. Again, when you're responding to questions, make sure the folks that are online have that opportunity to, to, to be responded to. Their questions, a lot of times they've typed their questions a whole lot earlier. 
um, for that. And so again, again, it also helps them real be. They know that they're being taken care of, and the people that are there in person realize that there's also a, an online audience as well. Um, so, and then again, also think about your audience's needs and plans. Um, this really is important when it comes to accessibility. So that when you are um, when you are um, doing an online event, if you're recording it, some of them are doing live transcripting, some of it does live captioning, and a lot of those are great. But I will tell you this: if your person that is that is presenting has a really thick, strong accent. Sometimes your live captioning is not the best uh, or your live transcribing. So just you will think that out, try those out and, and, and go for what's going to give the best experience. Because what you don't want is to have poor uh, you know, captioning or transcribing or whatever that's coming across take away from what the person's saying. Uh, so uh, we want to keep that in mind. A um, couple other things here. Um, your event itself. Um, really and truly, the success of it is also going to be based off of what you do before the event and what you do after the event um, for that, um, because that's as much. You get people excited. Like I said, when I got my swag box for that virtual conference, um, that hybrid conference there, I was excited. I was ready. I was pumped. I was ready to be able to do that. And that's where web, that's where email, that's where social, that's where even snippets about things from the past that might help highlight and market things that are coming um, are important to do. Um, your titles uh, for your um, for your emails and things that go out need to be really compelling because you know before we had a lot of word of mouth and 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 this is how we found out about these events and who's going to doing what now it's all pretty much coming across via email and so you want to make sure that you really want to be able to do that and make sure that they're descriptive that you're giving good information and also that the content is 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 created in a way to make it easily read and easily scanned. We're not readers anymore. We're skimmers, okay? Uh, and so bullet points, shorter sentences, um, less is better uh, on this. And then finally, think about how you want to reuse this content. Um, I, and many times, I counsel folks on taking, after their event is over, to go back through and pull out some little snippets, little 30-second, what, what we call in the podcast industry is eardrops. These, these, these snippets that are really deep, really moving, really compelling, to send back out as part of your post email, or hey, since you weren't able to make it, you might want to look at this. You missed something like this, and they can they can see that they can hear that. Uh, great opportunity. It's free. It's free content uh, that you've got, as well as being able to pull some of it out to be able to use for other educational opportunities. Uh, but again, uh, you've got it. It's there. Especially if you've got it recorded, it's been there as video. You might as well go ahead and take advantage of it. Uh, uh, last but not least, as we get going here again, uh, with your slides, we got to keep everything is uh, is is video. I uh, mean, video. I'm sorry, uh, saw the, the chat come through there. With your slides, keep them visual. Photos are good. Keep everything readable. I mean, um, Vimeo uh, for theirs, they talk about using a a, a, a rule that basically <laughs> keeps. Uh, I mean, I think they said no more than uh, six bullet points of six words uh, or less. Um, per screen uh, on that. So I've tried to kind of follow that uh, as well. Because again, visual is readable and readable is going to be a retention uh, on that. You don't want to give them a, a full paragraph uh, because again, window within the window. Keep it punchy. Absolutely. Absolutely, Shannon. Absolutely. Um, with that. And that's also, again, besides emails and stuff that you're sending out, but also in your slides as well. Uh, they're here to see you and watch you, not be, as a guy told me one time, he said, People are coming to these events for you to present to them, for you to talk to them, not for you to read them a bedtime story. So don't go put a slide up that you then just end up reading everything that's on the slide. That's not what it's there for. Okay, cameras as well. Um, this is my pet peeve. Uh, I what I don't like, and I'm looking at myself now. I'm I'm doing pretty good. You want to make sure that you are full and in frame. You don't want to be this head on a plate, but you also don't want to be where you're standing way back in the frame, because again. A window and a window and a window. We want people to see you. So make sure that you're there and make sure that you are looking at it. We have some folks who have multiple screens. So they've got their webcam over on their laptop, uh, but they're looking at their large screen because that's where their slides are. And it just looks like they're not talking to them because they spend their whole time staring at the wrong screen. So just make sure, again, it's something simple, but those little things like that really do help when it talks about building engagement. Same with backgrounds as well. Uh, I'm not a fan of virtual backgrounds uh, for a lot of folks. Um, some of the times it's hard because some of the newer technology is now doing like what the weathermen have. 
where it's actually taking you and giving you that virtual background and that virtual background is now your presentation. So you can actually be over on the side, be able to still kind of point at things and have the screen there. In fact, Microsoft Teams just introduced that and it's, uh, I think they're introducing it into their end of August, beginning of September uh, release. Uh, but the problem with virtual backgrounds is that sometimes they will change. Um, you know, if you ever want to test it out, you've got it on, test it on and begin to start pointing at things, point, it, point out, point at your head, uh, and see, and see if, if the virtual background continues or if all of a sudden you can see what's behind um, with that. We just want to make sure that people aren't being distracted by what's going on. Uh, because again, as their attention begins to slide and change, that's what happens. Um, okay, I am, I've kind of gotten to the end of, uh, of my slides here. Um, I'm sure there's some chat. I'm gonna pull my chat window back open and kind of uh, go back through on some of it. I'm also gonna let Mary and Michelle, if you saw something come through, hit me. Uh, with them and and let me uh, let me go with that. Yeah, um, so there's questions for a you. ton of discussion in the chat, which is excellent. Um, I first want to address a little bit of call out. You called Michelle and I out for not having our videos on during some of the presentation, um, and and we turned our videos off typically during our TMN Tuesday event so that the focus stays on the speaker. But you're right; it's very difficult sometimes for as for some speakers to, and you're an expert, so it's it's easier for you, but there's it's difficult sometimes for some speakers to talk to their camera engaging without another set of eyes to look at um, and kind of feed that reaction and that feedback off of. I will say this though, it's sometimes, and I, for some folks, they, this works uh, as well. Some folks will actually put a, a small post-it note or sticker or smiley face or a picture of their kids or something at near around on uh, above almost like the ring light stuff at their camera because at least begins to give them a face uh, or something like that to be able to look at and, and kind of lose themselves with that no i'm i'm totally i'm totally there with you on that uh and, and totally get that uh while we're talking about cameras there were some direct questions. okay i'm sorry real quick i saw that uh, it talks about zoom has a blur background option mm -hmm. it also has an option uh which i hate uh, because to me, it takes away from it, but it does allow you the option if you want to give yourself a mustache and a beard uh, and 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 do it while you've got it. So if you want to stay totally anonymous while you're giving your presentation, Zoom and give yourself the mustache and the beard. Uh, it's good. <laughs> yeah, and WebEx does too. WebEx will blur, but then you've got yeah. things where if I'm trying to use my hands, um, you've got to think about you know, and one of your one of your panelists made a great uh, point is that, you know, obviously talk about using your green screen and yeah, you can go fancy and get the green screen if you want to. But what really what you're just trying to do is to if you're going to use a virtual background is to make sure that there is a lot of contrast between you and the background, because that's what's all that's happening is that the, 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 the program itself is trying to say, OK, give me that contrast, because where that greatest level of contrast is, is where I need to create my cutout. So if yeah. you, especially, so if you'll light yourself up more and that stays back, then you're able in some cases to be able to knock that out. Uh, but to me, uh, the in-person spot is background is, is, is important. So one of the questions, and I think they're kind of talking about this here is um, Sharon's asking just basics. Um, what, what cameras would you recommend or types of cameras or numbers of cameras would you recommend? Um, and what kind of equipment is needed? Sure. Um, and, okay. and I, you and I have talked about the owls. Um, I want to uh, piggyback on your answer with the discussion about the okay. owls. From, I mean, really, truly, for most anything, you know, for me and my own setup. So for today, for example, um, while I can't actually pull my camera down and show my own camera, um, well, I guess I could if I had a mirror. Uh, but anyway, um, typically, what I like to do is I like to make I like to have at least two cameras. Um, one can be that, like I said, it can be the onboard laptop one uh, because there's that microphone that's there. Um, but I also have a Logitech um, Logistream uh, camera. It's a newer one. I like it because it's a 4K camera. Um, it sometimes actually acts as a second camera for when I'm out on another shoot. Um, I use it, uh, especially if I just need a good fixed width kind of camera. I also uh, have used a, this a lot. This is my, my trusty, also Logitech. Uh, in fact, I think the Logistream is kind of like the next generation of this. But this one right here, this was like $99. Um, it's HD, so it's running full 1080p, which is great. Um, and it's also got its own onboard mic, which is nice. Um, tripod, yeah, I would I would recommend a tripod, having a tripod. And the reason for that is not so much for the one that I'm using for my uh, screen, so the one I'm talking to right now, 
but it is nice to have something to be able to, um, and really truly, I'm just looking for something that would be able to hold the weight of, width of a, I mean, the weight of a phone. So uh, Best Buy, I mean, you can probably find one for 20 bucks. Amazon, I think Amazon Basics has got one that's pretty cheap. Uh, it's what I use actually when we're, when we're doing these like this, where I just need to have some, some ones uh, uh, up and around. And for me, I actually will probably, if I do, I usually will take two with me and I have my on board with mine. So it's a, that's a third. And the only reason for that is that I have three uh, USB ports. And so that does allow me to have those three opportunities there. Um, this one right here, if you're looking for the one I held up here, this is the, they put the number on it. So I think it's on the, oh, I think it's on the bottom here. This is the Logitech. Um, I will get that. I will get those numbers to y'all uh, on that. But like I said, the Logistream Stream is the newer one. It runs about 150 bucks. I would probably recommend getting that. The only downside to that one um, is that it is actually now using USB-C, which is the smaller little smaller little plug like this instead of the standard what I call old school USB. This one still does uh, on this. And um, I want to say how to do the nights and the four. Uh, on that. But anyway, I'll get you some numbers on that. Um, and so, then, John, so uh, kind of piggybacking off of that answer too, the Master National State Office has purchased 10 OWLs, um, and the, the OWL um, is a device that you set in the middle of the room. It has a 360 camera on it. It is both a speaker and a microphone. Um, we're, we've purchased these devices in order to use them at our um, hybrid annual meeting um, coming up in October with the anticipation of putting them into a um, kind of a rental stream um, uh, loaner program to Master Naturalist chapters to use for events that they have upcoming, um, specifically for Master Naturalist business. And so we'll be sending those out um, and we'll have more information on that kind of loaner program um, within the month or so. Um, a couple of things here. So let's see, uh, we got Mary Beth asking when a person in the room asks a question, do you put the camera on that person? Usually, usually, yes. I mean, more really, truly, at the end of the day, the most important thing, especially when a person in a room asks a question is the audio. Uh, I typically like having a camera on them if possible, uh, but it also depends on what you are using for your um, what you're hosting your event in. So if you're using a WebEx as an event, sometimes that cutting over from one camera to another sometimes can take a little bit. So it's the if you're staying on it, then yeah, that's great. But most importantly, is going to be the um, is going to be the, uh, the audio uh, on that. So I would rather have that. There was a lot of discussion in the chat that's related to that about bandwidth. So our master nationalist chapters will hold their trainings physically in in various different locations around their counties, um, and they've got master nationalists joining from various locations uh, in their home offices. How do our chapters? Um, manage or help to encourage uh, bandwidth. Think about bandwidth when they're hosting these hybrid events at the local nature center or at the local county library. Well, so um, Joseph's, I see Joseph talking about the platforms of downsized video quality, so shouldn't it? That's true. Um, the, the easiest, quickest, best answer for most everybody is use a hard connection. Don't do this on wireless if you can. Uh, Part of it is, in, in, in many cases, part of it is the fact that a wireless connection in an office space, whatever, is a shared connection. You are sharing that wireless. So like here at a and um, we have something called, we have TAMU Wi-Fi. And everybody on this floor, when they connect to TAMU Wi-Fi, is all connecting to the same port and the same shared bandwidth. So like, especially like when we do an event down in our big AgriLife Center, everybody's on their phone looking and doing all this stuff like that. I can't, I, I won't use it when I'm streaming. So I have, I go find the uh, the port in the wall and jack in because that port in the wall is not a shared connection, it's a dedicated connection. So therefore, I, if it's 10, 100 gig or whatever, I'm getting that speed straight and that bandwidth straight uh, on that. So yeah, and as for video, the same kind of thing with, with, with the question there. Yeah, it will downsize and sample it. I mean, it's no different than when you're watching a, watching something like ESPN uh, and something changes for them. Sometimes it'll be nice, high quality. And then for a moment, as it buffers and changes a little bit, it kind of, um, it blocks up a little bit and then it cleans itself back up. That's what's happening. And that's the whole point of those streaming, uh, when it streams out to a YouTube or it streams out to WebEx or whoever, Microsoft or whatever, that's Microsoft's job is to take that data as it's coming in 
and then begin to parse it all out as it needs to to make sure that the end user is getting it uh, in a format and in a speed and a rate that's that's equivalent to what they're what they're needing. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I so yeah, I would not be, but I've also done some things before where I've had to run everything off my 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 cell phone's hotspot uh, on that. Uh, so yeah, it's just one of those things you just kind of have to kind of keep in mind uh, and know what you're what you're doing there. Uh, Bill, as you said, use a hotspot. Yeah, I have done that before. I'm not, I'm not whatever really wanted to run a full everything off of it, but we've done some things where we've done a little bit of, of, of things here and there to be able to get some, uh, get some extra video for some different places. Some of the early discussion early on um, in your presentation was about roles and how many people um, would be the ideal number for a team to manage a hybrid event and where our chapters should look for those types of um, those people that within their chapter that could fill those roles, if they should look at hiring consultants um, for high production level events, or if they can train internally. Um, I want to answer some of that question. Um, our master nationalists have um, developed an incredible skill set to be flexible and adaptive and to learn new technology very quickly. Um, and, and I bet you that there are members within your chapters that can pick up some of these tips and tricks and can help to become part of your production team. I'm um, going encourage you to look at those um, kind of bringing in those, uh, those players early. Um, but John, if you'll talk about kind of the, the quantity or the, the different roles. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, first off, let me, let me applaud all of y'all. I said, looking at the chat, some of the discussions that I'm looking at here and some of your responses about what you're using to do what you guys do, that is awesome. I tell you what, if there were more people that had this level of, of, of skill and understanding, well, I might be out of a job, but, um, but man, that's awesome. Um, and so, yeah, no, I applaud y'all. Y'all, y'all are fantastic. This is great. Um, and, um, so what, let me, so let me talk about that for a second. Really, truly, if I had to, if I was going to say, you know, Hey, let's put a team together, uh, on this, I, I would probably look for, I would say minimum 3 people, probably maximum 5 after a while you start getting a little bit overkill. You know, so for us in the past, I would say, um, we have 1 person that is the producer and it's their role basically to control the camera angles. Um, it is their job not to become invested in the content. They should not care, you know, so go find somebody that doesn't care. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that you want to find somebody that, you know, that can fake that can, that can basically focus on camera 1, camera 2, share this screen, this, whatever many times. And I don't have 1 out here when I'm a producer, I've actually created my own flow chart. I have a printed flow chart. That's got name camera, this, that, and, so, and this is what I'm following all the way through. It is my job to basically run that show. And, and, and the camera angles and everything else. That's that person. I have somebody else that the second person then in there is what is kind of like a, a associate producer. I'm trying to think of like TV kind of names or whatever. But this person's job is to make sure that the presenters are all lined up that they're watching and making sure that people's cameras are turned on when they need to be turned on, turned off when they need to be turned off. And that depends on the platform. I mean, so for example, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams will only process nine video for a screen at a time. So if you're the 10th person and you're, and you're trying to get on video wise, you won't. So we have that person in there saying, okay, I need these four people to go and turn their cameras on. Uh, and doing that because again, it's not my job as the, as the main producer. I'm worried about getting these segments and getting these things ready to go. It's this person's job. Hey, if somebody drops off, it's their job to figure out how we're going to make things happen to continue the flow like it's supposed to. So there's that person. Now, sometimes that person also will be this third person, which would be um, basically my, my communications person. It's their job to be kind of like looking into the chat. If you're doing a moderated Q and a, they're triaging questions. So, you know, they're looking at all the questions they are going, okay, this is garbage. You know, this guy's asking what I had for lunch or, you know, what am I wearing? That doesn't matter. That, you know, it's camera. I'm, you know, that doesn't matter. It might be someone asking a question like, hey, I can't, my, my audio is not working. What do I do? That's not something that needs to be going into a main chat window or anything like that. And it's also not something that the person that's presenting needs to be worried about. So they're triaging that there may be ones that they're also answering questions that they can take care of. Hey, thanks for that. And here's something for everybody. It's at this website and they're pushing it out to everybody that way. 
or they're cutting it. And we have, we actually have our private chat. They will take stuff out of the the moderated Q and A and stick it into the private chat so that the person's not having to look at different um, types of different. It doesn't have to look at different panels, different windows, different tabs uh, for that. So that's what they do for that. So there's that one, one and a half one. And then, like I said, if you've got it, I really would recommend that you're looking at or finding the right person to be the host. Now that could be the host for the whole chapter. So every time, no matter what it is, whether they're presenting anything or not, they're coming on as the host. You know, think about those shows like Texas Country Reporter, or think about uh, your favorite sports, uh, you know, like the Sports Center or something like that. They have a host, and it's their job to kind of help people feel uh, it, there's a level of consistency because the presenters are changing every week. Hey. This is the way we do things. This is the way it is, and this is the way we're going to move. So I would say, if you can, I would say, you know, you, you want that three, uh, but trying to fit those four roles into those three people if possible. That's great. Thank you. And Michelle and I kind of toggle back and forth um, every other month or so with some of those roles, and that helps to uh, not create some of that mon monotony. Um, in the roles as well. Yeah. So you'll see that yeah. on our TMN Tuesday, sometimes she'll take the lead at introducing and being the MC of the event. Um, and sometimes I will take the lead and be the MC of that event. Um, or she'll run the tech on the backside and I'll, or I'll run the tech on the backside. And that helps to. And you know, what's interesting now is that we're also beginning to see with this idea of with, with media kind of beginning to kind of kind of begin to change and morph and, 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 and assume qualities of other forms of media, we see that a lot. So like, for example, with podcasts and even with radio, where in the past, long past, you never would have somebody in the booth say anything to the host on the air, you know? But now with podcasts and everything else, because again, it's this idea of feeling like I'm a part of a production. I'm not just attending the production, but I'm a part of it. You're gonna have folks that are gonna jump in and be able to say, and that's the reason why you, and like I said, y'all have done a great job today is to jump in and go, hey, John, while you're doing this, can you talk a little bit about this? Or, And so some folks actually are now playing off of that role where that person that is, who is that producer role or associate producer role are maybe going out and grabbing things off the web or grabbing things out of chat or grabbing things wherever it is, especially if you're talking about even using social media, uh, grabbing those things and bringing them back in to again, make those connections and make those uh, make those things happen. So. So if you're, and this is a, a callback to a really early question on, um, but as we're thinking about hybrid, so we've got audiences in two different locations, um, thinking about our producer roles, our three to five potential people, where do those people need to be physically? Do Can you have somebody who is your, your chat, your MC that's joining from virtually um, and managing chat there, or do they need to physically be in there to kind of manage the room at the same time? I think that, especially if you're doing hybrid, if you're doing hybrid, I think that you really need to, I, I think it behooves you to have the host for sure be up in person. It really does seem to work. But again, with that understanding that they're also, they're also a virtual host, you know? And that's one of those things where, you know, the in-person host can always be a virtual host, but the virtual host can't always be an in-person host. So that's why for that, the other roles pretty much can be virtual, can be in other places. And I would recommend that either they be in places that they are most comfortable and most able to be able to get what they need done. So, yeah, I'm, I want you to be virtual because I know that you're going to have a hardwired connection. Or I, I do want you to be, I, I do want you to be virtual, but I want all three of you virtually to be, I want you to be virtual from where I am, but I want all three of you to be in the same room together. Because then you don't have to worry about chatting and we've done that before we've had an event where we had a bunch of different people, a bunch of concurrent sessions going on people running multiple concurrent sessions, but we were all in the same room together so that we could lean over and go, hey, are you, we're all starting now at, okay, we've now just started or somebody's asking about whatever and we're able to talk and not have to worry about having a private chat because we're all in the room together uh, on that. So, yeah, it's, it's all right. again, some of it also depends on if you think those people are not ever going to actually be on camera or actually be on audio, then yeah, having them in a, in a room together sometimes actually is a little bit better. Excellent. Um, somebody asked me about, do I edit the recordings of my events? Typically, no. Um, and the reason for that is I'm a, I'm a big stickler of this happened in real time. Um, and in some cases for me, that's real life. And fortunately uh, or unfortunately, real life is, 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 is personal. Uh, sometimes it's messy. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of us, for the most part, are um, are, are okay with that. And I, I'll use a really good example. Um, we had a, 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 a presentation that we did a while back, 
And fortunately, this was just the run through, but the guy was giving his presentation and his cat kept jumping up onto his desk and would kind of walk up and get in front of the camera and he would put it down. And I, at first I was like, oh, why, you know? Uh, and then I asked him, I said, um, what's up with the cat? And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. This is on just, you know, I've been working at home and remote. He said, but, um, I hate to tell you this, but my cat actually won employee of the month last month. Um, and I was like, what? And, 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 what? and I tell you that, not because I, he must have a really awesome cat, um, but um, the fact of the matter is that we, especially like when you think about podcasts like that, we appreciate those personal moments because it reminds us that even though we're on a, we a face on a screen, we're still human. We're still people. Now, I do agree. Totally, you want to minimize distractions and stuff, but again it's about it's about humanizing it's about being part of something and we all like that if anything it, it's a great story it's the fact that i that happened so i get to tell this story to you and it now allows me to be able to connect with you in a different way because deborah just gave me a heart so right now it, it, it achieved its purpose well and it, it, michelle and i both have had children walk through the back of the of the background and something to think about with my desk placement later is um, probably shouldn't have the door to the to the living room in the background, um, things like that. But yeah, it does. I think everybody's learned to be more flexible for giving, and then you can just get to kind of uh, know a lot more about the person that's behind the screen sometimes. Um, and it is I want to just go ahead. I want to go ahead and apologize to Jim. Uh, I am a fast talker, and I. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've been married for 29 years, and I think my wife on the day we got married said, come again, because <laughs> I think I went through the vows too fast. Um, so uh, I apologize. Um, hopefully when this recording, we'll also get a good transcript out of it, uh, and that will allow you to do that. Uh, let me jump back real quick, and you mentioned editing. One of the other reasons why about editing, the only time I will actually look at editing an event um, is for um, when I want to pull out, like I said, little snippets or if there was something where we did a breakout or we paused or we had a 15 minute break, yeah, sure, people can scrub through that and that's fine when it's on the man, but sometimes it just feels better and looks better to do that. But uh, I'm not going through and changing us and ums or anything like that. Um, I will even try and make sure that when we do our events to make sure that we have um, good slates at the front, title cards at the front and the back so that when it is fully recorded, I've already got those things that will pretty much serve as my YouTube um, title cards uh, as well. So that, uh, Kathy, you mentioned about explaining the need for two cameras there. Um, oh, Mary's already got that there uh, for that. Um, yeah, I, when I John, my need for two cameras, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please, go ahead. Okay, no, when you talk about the need for two cameras, really and truly, again, if this is a hybrid event, it really is um, one being able to have something for a, an audience, especially if you are in one way or the other trying to make sure that everybody is engaged together. And so we would just want to make sure that that everybody has that opportunity. It's not so much as an, as, as necessary for the people who are in attendance because they can see other folks that are around them. Sometimes it's more about the the folks that are online, just again, feeling like I'm not just this single soul out here or a single name uh, on that, um, with that. So that, or again, if you need a second camera to show, show something specific. So uh, we did some one, one time with a, with a bunch of soil, it was a soil, soil class, and we had the person speaking, but then we had a camera that was over the top of a, of a table so that we could slide things underneath and they could talk about the qualities of soil or composition or whatever it was. So those kinds of things on that. Hey John, before we run down, um, there's a ton more questions still coming in. We are at 20 minutes past the hour and I did promise you one hour. Um, and I know that we've got a few folks that have jumped off already. Would you mind answering a few more questions or do you want? Oh, absolutely. To... Oh, I, I get jazzed about this stuff. So okay. yeah, I, 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 we'll, we'll, talk until, sure. we'll talk until, we'll talk until the water or the iced tea runs out. Okay, uh, sounds and, good. Uh, yeah, we're good to go. There's a lot of questions um, or requests for your flow charts. Um, to, to think through the production. Really, truly, for me, I'm, I I would use whatever is easiest. I mean, I would recommend using whatever is easiest. I've used uh, PowerPoint. You know, I just use PowerPoint shapes and, and things like that. And really, truly, it's nothing fancy. All I am doing is giving myself a single square for every camera shot, basically, or, or presenter. 
So I'll have a slide that says, you know, title slide. And, and underneath it, it might have the name of the file or slide one. Uh, and might the next square might say, you know, uh, for extension, for example, it'll be like, you know, Jeff Hyde, you know, and then underneath it, I'll put a note or two that says like intro, um, doesn't need any slide sharing. Okay, great. Next person, you know, I'll say, you know, queue up slide or whatever. And it's a slide for introing this panel. Okay. And there's sometimes I have to do some hacks where, like, for example, with Microsoft Teams, especially in a live event, there's no way to do a video wall where you can see everybody at once. So I cheat. I share a screen on another computer that is everybody that's on the presentation, and I share that screen so that you can see it as a video wall. So I have to tell myself, okay, cut to AgriLife Guest 2, which is actually this computer right back here. Uh, and so it's just everything that I do that is, is going to be a change, cut from camera one to camera two, cut from single camera to camera plus attendee, I mean, or plus presenter, those kinds of things. Uh, and they can get dramatically complex because I've done ones before where I had uh, intro music and I had a running slideshow so people could see sponsors and and little little snippets and tips and things like that. And then it cuts out of that. So I had to make sure, okay, turn cue this on and cue this on because you've also got to make sure with certain programs to make sure that the computer shares the sound and all that kind of stuff. So little things like that because when that show's going, that producer, that person's got to be completely focused. And the more that you have it all down and played out, that's just less you have to worry about. So I've used everything from like MindMeister, and I used to use old uh, like um, Visio kind of stuff. Uh, PowerPoint is fine. Um, Illustrator, uh, Canva sometimes now, because I can just grab the shapes, stick them all in there, and then I can just type stuff in. So whatever's easiest. It could even just be a piece of scratch paper that you've kind of written down your flow of show on. Oh, oh no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm glad this doesn't show the rest of my my desk because there's all kinds of junk. And Shannon said you're orchestrating the production. Oh, I thought she was just talking about all my hand motions because I'm a I'm a hand talker. Uh, so yes. Okay. Um, are there more questions in the chat, Michelle? I have missed a few. I'm sure. Did you were you able to see any? questions or uh john if there's any other questions that you wanted to address i think i'm pretty good i my watch just buzzed and reminded me i have a I forgot i'm uh, actually producing a 130 uh webinar uh so woohoo uh i i just want to say i'm gonna take this last minute or two here i just want to say thank you to everybody that that jumped on today um i i love doing this uh and so to to see other people's love and and their desire to do these kinds of things, uh, and it's seeing this in the chat, uh, it just uh, it, it it makes me feel good, uh, and it makes me feel good to see that 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 you guys are out there are doing it and doing it well, uh, and that I've gotten to be a little just a little part of it, and so uh, I'm actually hoping that uh, Mary Pearl will let me come and sneak in on some of y'all's just to audit, see how you're doing things, uh, because that's the way I learn stuff too. Uh, and so um, I'm looking forward to, to more opportunities uh, to, to learn from y'all. So thank you very much. Yeah, you are absolutely welcome to attend our annual meeting this October, our hybrid event. We're excited about it. And our chapters we'll produce. Yeah, <laughs> not just or, attend. Or how much do you want to volunteer, John? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. As much as you as much as you want to let me, I, you know, I I will I will I will be glad to. And in fact, I do that. Sometimes I get called in uh, because someone's like, hey. I'm just, we can do this, but I'm just a little nervous. Do you mind just kind of hanging in the back and catching, catching things for us? You bet. So that's, that's kind of what I do. What I do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We've got lots of kudos coming into the chat. Um, and we really appreciate your extra time today with us. No problem at all. Y'all, y'all have a good one. Thanks again. Absolutely. Do, do, I, now, so do, you, want me to, do I, do you hang up or do I hang up? How do you want to, how do we, how do we end this? Is there a, is there a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle end? Teenage Mutant.